Mia Bay. You are a historian and you hold a chair in the American history at the University of Pennsylvania. You have written six books and your latest one is called Traveling Black, a story of race and resistance. Mia, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, glad to be here. So Mia, this book is it's like throwing someone throwing a cold bucket of uh, a bucket of cold water in my face because you know i hear in the news from time to time about uh about the difficulties that black people have to endure when traveling you know like just driving a car from one mm -hmm. place to the other and they get stopped or but when when you detail everything with so much precision it, it's just it's fascinating and horrendous <laughs> uh, i am um, so before we get there i wonder if you could tell us a little bit uh, about yourself you your story history uh what is it that led you towards this profession oh that's a really good question well you know i grew up mostly in canada you're in montreal aren't you right where do you but grow up I grew up in Toronto. I also lived in Alberta as a small child. I used to visit Montreal. Um, but my mother was from the United States, um, from Virginia. So I heard a lot about this, the United States. So I guess I kind of became interested in US history partially because it was sort of a family background, you know, that that I was exploring. Okay, and how, uh, how you <laughs> One thing is to want to explore a little bit of your family history, and another thing is to get a PhD. I know. <laughs> so, so can you can you tell us through that transition? Okay, this seems interesting, but then you devoted a few years of your life to this. Subject. Yeah, I mean, at the more I studied history, the more I thought it was really important, especially when it came to understanding things like. Uh, the relationship between different social groups, between races, because, you know, that sort of, you know, in both of our multicultural societies in Canada and the U.S., thing, things are very divided across group lines of race. So I was, I was very curious about that. And I thought I ended up finding history to be the most important and interesting way to try to understand social divisions and tensions over race and class and uh, if you don't mind I me mean, asking what is your race i mean you look like a mix of different things so <laughs> i am a mix of different things my uh, mother my mother's an african-american woman from virginia whose family has been in the u.s since the beginning of time almost um and my father was my late father was norwegian Okay, uh, so I guess it was uh, through your mother that you became interested not only in history, but history and race, uh, in particularly African-American. Yes. And uh, you have written uh, five books before this, and most mm -hmm. of them are related to race. Can you tell us what are the previous books that you wrote, and more or less like uh, one or two lines about them? Okay, well, I started out with uh, a book that was my doctoral dissertation called The White Image in the Black Mind, African-American Ideas About White People. It focused on the 19th century and what African-Americans were saying about race in a century when everyone kind of, when even like scientists held that there were significant differences between the races. Um, and um, then I wrote, um, I, I wrote a book on um, called To Tell the Truth Freely, which is a life of Ida B. Wells, who was an anti-lynching crusader, a Black woman who campaigned to have people held accountable for murdering Black people, which was a sort of all-time high in the 19th century. Um, I also did a volume of her essays called um, The Light of Truth. I uh, co-authored a textbook with several other authors called Freedom on My Mind, which is a history of African Americans. And I've um, uh, co-edited a couple of edited volumes, one of which is on race and retail, and the other is called Towards a History of Black Women. Mm. Okay, uh, 
um, another personal question. Have you ever been a victim uh, either in the US or Canada of racial discrimination? And if so, uh, what exactly? Um, yeah, I have. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I realize that I have life easier than a lot of other people, relatively light skinned and, um, and class privileged, but people communicate to me sometimes that, you know, that they, that they think I'm not going to be good at things or I don't know about things or I have gotten whatever job position or benefit I have because of affirmative action. That's a big, sometimes a big thing here in the United States. Um, so, you know, those kind of um, microaggressions, one might call them, are things that, you know, I deal with on a regular basis. Wow. Okay. Uh, so then what is it that uh, inspired you to write this book to focus on transportation and traveling black? I think that the, um, well, there are a couple of different things, but probably one of the most central ones is when I was writing this, a biography of Ida B. Wells, this 19th century crusader against anti-lynching, she became a journalist and a political activist after an incident when she was kicked off a train. It was in the 1880s and she was riding in what used to be called the ladies car, which was a special car on the train that was a little nicer than the others and set aside for women. And this was before uh, official Jim Crow. So there were no colored cars, but it, also, it had already become customary to not necessarily allow black women to ride in the ladies car. Um, so one day when she was riding in it, she had ridden it successfully before she was kicked off. And that was the first time I realized that before they developed Jim Crow cars or colored cars, as they knew, there was this gender division that preceded it. And that made me curious about the history of segregation, like how it actually got instituted and then how did it move to different forms of transportation? Because just even Thinking about it, I realized that the ladies' car was typically at the front of the train, but later blacks would have to ride at the back of the bus. So I was like, how do they like reinvent it for all these new technologies? Mm -hmm. And I just started to, to poke around. I was just curious while I was still writing about Wells. And that kind of got me off on this project. I never stopped trying to figure out what happened next. Wow. Okay, you opened the book. We are describing how Joseph K. Bowler used to travel to the south and that was the year 1922 so to give the listeners uh, an idea of what was it like to be black and travel at that time can you describe that scene yeah he this this was something that he that was written about in the chicago defender black newspaper in the 1920s and this man is a minister who lives in massachusetts but like many black people during that time, he would travel south because there were conferences and other you know, business relatives. Um, and he said that when he traveled south, he had a whole kit that he would, he would equip himself with. He would bring a pair of ratty old overalls. Um, he would bring a wash, uh, he would bring um, a little stove. He would bring a selection of canned goods, things to wash and he explained that it was all about he he didn't he wore the overalls because the Jim Crow cars were filthy and sometimes had actual animals riding in them, um, and it, you know they were the smoking cars generally and people people spat chewing tobacco on the floor and so forth. So instead of wearing his you know his nice suit that he would wear as a minister, he wore the overalls and then he carried the the, the cook stove and other sort of cooking and cleaning equipment because. Um, African Americans were not allowed in the dining car on, on many trains and often not e even actually given any sort of opportunity to get or buy something to eat. So, um, so he, he, they really had to come prepared with everything they needed, needed to eat on their journey. I get the impression that they not only wanted to separate black people, but at the same time, they wanted to humiliate them. And I, I get the impression throughout this whole journey is way more than I don't want to sit next to uh, a black person. I want, in addition to that, humiliate them and, and make them feel like less of a person. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's true. And I think there was a little bit of a sort of almost conscious, somewhat conscious commitment to that. Um, 
the segregation, the laws that actually institute Jim Crow cars um, take shape in the in the 1880s and 1890s, which is an era when when the when the South is restoring white supremacy and it's doing it partially by sending out a message to, to white voters who come in and vote Democratic and vote in support of white supremacy, that they are superior to black people and that they will have superior, superior facilities and that they don't have to have anything to do with white people. The politicians behind this message are partially trying to hold off some kind of um, alliance between blacks and whites, because this is a period when black and white farmers at least briefly experiment with the idea of working together to put pressure on the various plutocrats to get paid better and treated better. And so there's a kind of divide and conquer strategy going from coming from the ruling class. And part of it does focus on what you should be worried about is, is black people black people sort of doing better than you are. You should be worried about middle class black people riding on, riding in first class cars. You should preserve certain spaces for white people. And by the 20th century, you do have, um, you have these mandated separate facilities, waiting rooms, um, Jim Crow cars on the train, and they are always manifestly inferior to those offered to whites. And that's part of the design and part of the system. And, um, you know, part of it is, is a sort of, I guess, message to the white population that white supremacy is something that's working for you. Wow. Can you, uh, um, can you describe what exactly is the Jim Crow law? And then also, if you could describe what is a uh, Jim Crow car as well. Okay, how sure, how were they different? I mean, I, I think they were out of going out of the way to make the... Jim Crow car uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, they were. Not um, a place to just carry somebody from place A to place B, but I, they, they, it seemed like they were especially designed to be uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as possible. Yeah. Um, the Jim Crow, what we talk about is Jim Crow laws are, are, are the laws that mandate things um, must be separate but equal. So, um, you know, the most famous case around Jim Crow law is the, is the Supreme Court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson, which basically said that all these laws um, saying, giving, putting blacks in separate facilities are illegal so long as they're separate but equal. And, but they really derive originally from uh, what were usually called separate car laws and had to do with the railroads. They had to do with these, what were informally called Jim Crow cars. The words Jim Crow come from um, minstrelsy where um, a Jim Crow was a minstrel character of a sort of ragged black man. Um, and In blackface, right? blackface and it was sort of an insulting way to refer to black people um and it became one of the names used for the lowest class car on the um which at at that time was um not just a it was not just the second or third class car it was also usually the car that was riding right behind the engine so like smoke would be coming in tinder sometimes one of the reasons they developed the ladies car is that you could actually have your skirt go on fire if you were riding right behind the engine if you're wearing some of those 19th century big skirts it was a little bit dangerous and the jim crow car as you as you observed it never got any better it was always the oldest car on the railroad and when they started making um when they started to move towards all metal cars they made they made all the old wooden cars into jim crow cars so that around the turn of the century, you get all these train crashes where everyone who dies or is seriously injured is in the Jim Crow car, almost everybody, because what happens is the all metal engine and the all metal passenger cars behind the Jim Crow car just sort of collapse the Jim Crow car wow. the train crashes. Um, and then beyond that, Jim Crow cars are usually um, on smaller trains. They're also the smoking car. So they'll have us, they're what's called combination cars. The Jim Crow section will be one section, all black and all black men and women need to sit there. And then the other section, you'll have the smoking section. Um, and some, and often you'll have only one bath, like they have one bathroom at each end. So the black 
people will have, the black men and women will have to share a bathroom, which wasn't the norm at that time, just as it isn't now. So there's all these different, mm. his poor air quality, lack of safety. Um, and then also they would do things like if there were prisoners on the train, they would put them in the Jim Crow car. If there was um, a news vendor se selling um, newspapers and often things like bananas, they would also be in the Jim Crow car. Um, and I mentioned bananas because if, if you travel through Texas in the summer and someone's selling bananas in your car, you're, you're going to be very uncomfortable because the smell was just incredible. Wow. Wow. Okay. So then, uh, then comes the automobile and you will think, okay, I, I, I'm a black person. I can have my own automobile and sit wherever I want to, but traveling by car wasn't that much better. Uh, can you, can you tell us how all the challenges that a black traveler has to endure uh, when, when they, they were able to drive their own cars? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, initially, um, black people were very excited about cars. They were sort of early adapters, wealthy blacks like Jack, um, Jack Johnson, the boxer, bought cars very early. W.B. Du Bois bought car, a car very early. But the problem with cars, especially as cars became more useful, as, as, as the nation developed a network of roads and roadside places where you could stay and get gas, um, was that you could ride your, you know, you, you could experience considerable equality while you're driving your car, but you would have to stop and get gas. You would have to stop at roadside hotels and all of these accommodations that are crucial to actually going anywhere in your car would would turn out would segregate fairly rapidly gas stations um, would cater would as they gas was initially sold in hardware stores, but when they developed gas stations. Um, they were trying to kind of expand the driving population and they really focused on getting white women to come to gas stations. So they made them very domestic. They emphasized their cleanliness and they kind of sometimes discouraged and sometimes did not allow black people to get gas at them. And in the South, it was very common for gas stations to have only one set of restrooms and not allow black people to use them. So they would be, and that happened in the North sometimes as well. And would they be denied uh, service at a restaurant, for example, if they had to stop and, and eat? Oh, that food? was that was extremely common. In fact, that actually made early bus rides just agonizing for Black people because the buses didn't even want to take them because they'd be like, I've seen evidence where the bus would say, "Well, you can ride our bus, but you can't you can't actually use any of the rest stops, and it's an eleven hour ride." So, wow. You know, um, because it was sort of even in the even in the north, it was kind of customary that blacks were not necessarily welcome in restaurants and hotels, um, and that was a problem throughout throughout the automotive era for blacks. And did it get any better when blacks started traveling by airplanes? I mean, it's just getting on that tube and getting out, no? Um, the airplanes were, were somewhat better, um, though I did find evidence that some of the earliest airplanes would not carry Black people, and there was kind of attempts to segregate early on. Um, but airplanes were a little better. Um, the, the Jim Crow laws, even in Plessy versus Ferguson, don't really apply to interstate transportation. So the airlines never had were on never were on solid legal ground to discriminate in the air. And while they did so informally through the early 50s, it wasn't it wasn't a lot. There was I mean, there was also never a lot of black people riding on airplanes. So the custom by the 50s had become that maybe the stewardess tried to make whatever black passengers get who got on a plane sit in the same row, which is something my mother actually experienced in the 50s. The first time she ever flew, I asked her what, what it had been like. Long before I thought of this project, I was like, what was it like? Was it scary? And she was like, you know what I really remember is I, there was only one other black person on the on the plane and this this guy sat beside me and that was that was like an arrangement in the made by the airline they would once they saw you they'd move you if they needed to yeah i recently saw a youtube video uh, i guess last year 
uh, where a white woman was complaining that she didn't want to be sitting next to a black person. And mm -hmm. I forgot, I think uh, she was kicked out of the airplane, but I forgot what was the outcome of that. Yeah. It's just incredible. We are, let's say, let's say it was last year, we are in 2020, and that, that sort of mentality still exists. And there was somebody else, um, what is it complaining that there was a, a, a black person flying first class and, and how was that possible? <laughs> yeah, no, sad to say this kind of stuff still happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I know it still happens, but uh, at one moment in time, though, that segregation start crumbling. I, I, at one moment in history, do we see some improvements in, in or some desegregation? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One, one thing that was really striking to me is that African Americans fought this segregation from the beginning. And in and, and some ways, it, it, some, of, some of the laws are actually passed because Blacks are insisting on sitting in a lady's car and stuff like that. Like Ida B. Wells, who I started with, you know, one of the reasons I had to past Jim Crow cars is middle class black women like Ida B. Wells were like, I'm going to sit in the lady's car. And I'm, you know, and if, if you don't want me to sit there, you're going to have to like, carry me out and you're going to have to, you're going to have to win a court battle. So segregation takes shape in response partially to black resistance to it. And then that resistance continues, even if it as it becomes legal, um, people try to find ways around it. One of the ways in which they target the legal basis of segregation is to go to this question of whether interstate transportation is actually legal. This is something that African Americans bring to court over and over again with sort of ambiguous results, but um, sometimes promising results. Uh, people also attack it in the North, the NAACP and other civil rights organizations that take shape in the early 20th century. Um, try to attack it in the North. The problem is it's, you know, it's a kind of expensive thing to attack. It involves a lot of individual litigants at various points when it doesn't have a lot of money. The NAACP is like, you know, we think this is an important issue, but we're focused on education, anti-lynching. We can't do that much. But they encourage ordinary Black people to pursue their own civil suits, which actually does happen. There's like a lot of civil suits against bus stations against bus companies um, and and ordinary people also just sometimes they just refuse to to um, obey the segregation laws so some of the breakthrough cases occur just because you have people just refusing um, ordinary people or sometimes prominent people one of the big breakthrough cases was in 1941 and um, it was when uh, America's at that time only black congressman was kicked out of a Pullman with Pullman car, which were these sort of luxury cars, trains, and he sued and he had the connections to take it all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and he won. And then his his victory made other more ordinary black people refuse to get off buses or move out of wherever they're supposed to go. So this this kept going, but in the end, it was sort of like a combination of three things legal challenges, um, just direct resistance um, and protests that would begin to break down um, the legal and, and sort of business foundations of segregation. And you found that some of the, most of the challengers of these laws were women as well, or, or was there equal more or less? I think Especially in the 19th century, women were more numerous in, in, the in, the, in the legal cases. And that was precisely because for as long as the ladies' car was a category and you had people like Ida B. Wells being kicked out of the ladies' car, you had a real legal issue. Like, why am I not a woman was basically what these, what, how these women would go to court. And they would get very ambiguous answers. Like Ida B. Wells was told that she was just trying to harass people. That's what the court ended up deciding. But we know when it got to the it, it, one thing that the southern states began to recognize it, is that this was not actually a good legal foundation for segregation because they just wasn't a way that they could do it. So that's why more women challenge it up to the 1890s. But I think women continue to be more numerous than men, partially because what happens with men 
Um, and we see this e even in relationship to municipal, municipal transportation, like in the Montgomery bus boycott. Men who challenge segregated transportation are sometimes treated so violently that it's actually too dangerous to do. So they get, you know, so that they, they have, you know, they, they may not get to court, they may be actually thrown off the train or beaten up or sometimes even shot. So um, women have a little bit more chance to actually end up in court. Right. Okay. And today, like uh, in a regular day of 2021, we hear the slogan driving while black quite often. And it's just that black people get stopped more often, oftentimes for no reason at all. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you tell us more or less what's happening today, 2021, uh, in, in uh, yeah, uh, as a black person to travel from pl one place to the other? How much discrimination there is today? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because, you know, by the time I got to the end of the book, you know, they were near the end of the book when there are actually significant legal victories and in, 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 in terms of public accommodations. I really also had to acknowledge that there were many ways in which things haven't changed as much as they should have. And um, that had to do with things like driving well black and also the ways in which um, public investment in, in in um, public transportation has diminished since the 1960s. We don't, you know, in, here in the United States, we no longer have an extensive rail system. We have fewer bus routes. So people of color um, don't, don't have the opportunity to travel in these now easier to travel and things. And instead, most people travel by car. And with cars, driving while black is a term that could have been around forever in the sense that black people who drove were often have long been subject to greater police scrutiny, but it really became a term in the late 1880s, I think it was, or early 90s, because of um, the because of the ways in which the the they were began to search people for drugs on the highway and began to just sort of pick up people on suspicion um, and search their cars and that kind of profiling of drivers has always the police have always singled out black people for that kind of profiling and picked them up in disproportionate numbers in relationship to their proportion on the road and um you know most black men especially can tell you stories of being stopped numerous times mm -hmm. Um, and, and and searched and um, and people are stopped far more than is in any way justified in terms of the likelihood that anything is going to be found. So it's become and and then of course we have these famous incidents, which are one of the impetuses behind Blacks Black Lives Matter, where these stops go awry and there's actual conflict, someone's shot. So it's a kind of terrifying part of driving while black, which is seems like it's only gotten worse over time. Uh, is there a time in history where black people could, will be able to travel without <laughs> feeling fear of being discriminated, single out, or uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you see that progress happening? I mean, I think we would get to that point only when we did, you know, achieve true racial equality where people weren't making sort of attachments you know, people weren't assuming that black people were criminals or poor, where we had a more diverse police force, we, where we had commitments, equal treatment. I, I don't, I mean, I'm hoping that things, uh, the last, you know, the last presidential administration was very bad for that. There was no restraint on policing. I'm hoping things will get better, but I think it will take a lot of work on the part of a lot of different entities to improve that. And I think part of an improvement might be, you know, a larger, safer, and more equitable public transportation system, uh, which would also help us with climate change. But, you know, I'm, that's, it's, it's a lot. We need yeah, a lot. Yeah. Well, Mia, this is an amazing topic. I, I really love it. You go into detail how uh, black people face challenges while traveling by car, by train, by bus, by every means of transportation. Uh, I I think uh, the readers will be delighted to read this book. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where people can follow you. Okay, the um, 
The title is Traveling Black, A Story of Race and Resistance. It's published by Harvard University Press. Um, you can get it at bookstores, on Amazon. Um, it's a, widely available. Um, and I am on Twitter at uh, Mia um, underline, underline Bay, um, and, and also can be found at the University of Pennsylvania. And the book cover has a very nice drawing or design. Uh, it's eye it, it does. It's very nice. <laughs> Mia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Enjoy talking to you.